Hey everybody, Adam Savage and I am, where am I? You're at the American Museum of Natural History oh. on the fifth floor in the exhibitions department. And this isn't, this isn't being exhibited, this is going out on exhibit, but Beck, you, you, this is your work. This is my baby oh for my now. Oh my God. <laughs> now, when you're tackling something like this, Roger, are, you're not replicating something that anyone has seen before. I know that you've got to have a lot of data, but how do you interface with the sculptor to get uh, paleontological accuracy. Yeah, so Beck did an enormous amount of work to make this model over the last year. And we have a lot of interaction in that time. And you know, this is a model of Triceratops, the yeah. horned dinosaur, you might've heard of it. <laughs> it's kind of famous. And it's for a new exhibit that we're opening in November called Impacts, yeah. the end of the age of dinosaurs. And we really wanted to capture what Triceratops might've looked like as a real animal based on scientific evidence. Yeah. So nobody's ever seen Triceratops alive. Mostly all we have in the fossil is the bones, although we also have things like skin impressions. Right. Um, and the footprints, so the fossilized trackways that tell us a bit about how the animal moves. And we're trying to use all of that information and fill some of the gaps with plausible information too. Um, and it basically just involves a lot of back and forth over a long time, like trying to find things that work and make sure we're sticking to the scientific evidence. Because right. we're not just trying to make a monster, we're trying to communicate something we know about an animal that once lived on Earth that we think is really cool. <laughs> so, so Beck, you get skin impressions or skin reference to start to create to create the texture of the skin. How does that process work? Um, actually, the skin is like the last element of yeah. this. Um, it starts off where we come up with a pose, and um, there's a lot of discussion with. Roger and a staff to kind of figure out what the environment of how this animal is. Yeah, how yeah. he's going to stand and like what interaction he's going to have with other animals mm -hmm. or the space. And then from there, we'll make a small scale model. Okay. Um, and that will kind of give everyone an impression of what you know the environment is. Right. That's the first animal. agreement. That's a for, yeah, and it also kind of gives us an idea of scale. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard to tell like how big this thing is. You know, on the scale, but it gives everyone a good idea. And when well, you sorry. sometimes take that scale model and put it into a model of the room it's going in to understand how they'll relate to yeah, each other. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a lot of that going on, um, and then from there we can kind of figure out the other elements like of this diorama. So it was it's going behind a large tree, so we can see like what areas don't need to be worked on oh. as intensely because it's behind the viewer. Gotcha. So it helps us kind of figure out where to put the hatches for like access to the inside of the animal when we're taking it apart and reassembling it. Oh, because he's not necessarily monolithic and he has to be moved to places. Yes, yeah. So <laughs> everything in our museum um, has to kind of fit through two double doors. So oh you can't see, but there's seams in oh, this. Yep, there we and go. And they travel, you know, it travels to different venues around the country. Of course, when Triceratops was alive, the dinosaurs themselves, they would have used triple doors. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't do that when we made the museum. So, very tight fitting hatch here. But oh, you get an idea. It's kind of, it's very crude on the inside. Yeah. Here's this, there's a steel armature in there with these wooden gussets. And then over the gussets, a uh, spray foam yeah. is applied. And then I carve that down. Ah, okay. So it's just, you know, it's the same stuff that you use in walls. Right, right. You know? And you're and you're using these wooden ribs that are kind of getting you close to the overall shape. Yeah, and within a few inches. Right, right, right. So that I have room to play with the foam. And so then you sculpt down to get the form and then you sculpt down into that to do the texture. Yeah, so then it gets coated, actually, you can see here, oh. it gets coated in a hard shell. Right, right, And right. so this allows us to be durable and lightweight. Um, and so over this, then the texture gets yeah. applied. But so that's clay, right? Uh, this is an epoxy. It's okay. like a two-part epoxy. Yeah. And it kind of, it feels a lot like clay, but you have like a two-hour window. So sometimes I'll make like a texture mold, which mm -hmm. um, like for this guy, we're going to go with like kind of an elephant skin texture. So I actually took impressions off of our elephant collection. So this looks like it's almost finished. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, what, what is left to work on this guy? So once we're, once everyone's done, everything gets moved to the gallery okay. and then everything gets set up. And so the setup will involve, you know, obviously transporting it, but then we'll have to do a little detail around the feet to kind of give it, you know, to ground it in the space a little more. Mm -hmm, so it might mm -hmm. involve like adding some dirt or, and there's actually a, a trunk that he's gonna be, he has in his mouth. Oh, so, nice. Yeah, yeah he's so pulling down a tree. He's pulling down a tree. Oh. 
Yeah, oh, we kind of referenced cool. elephants and other. It seems like a very dynamic pose. Yeah. So, but that's going to involve like possibly integrating that yeah, in the space yeah. more. So. Um, behind this, I saw some stuff that was much more in progress. Can we talk about that stuff? Sure. This is an early relative of whales. Oh, wow. So, you know, whales look like fish, but they evolved from mammals that lived on land. This is a, what um, an early whale was? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was wa it walked on land, so. Here we want our models of extinct animals to represent us, reflect our scientific understanding of them. Right. Like sometimes like a cutting edge scientific understanding and some of those things, they don't seem intuitive to us as humans because mm -hmm. the fact is we never saw these animals alive. Right. So you say it's got, each one is the current story we have of everything we know. Yeah. Yeah. And we know a lot sometimes, but yeah. Triceratops, like many things are known. There's a few things that like go slightly beyond our knowledge. My f one of, there's, a, there's things I really love about this. Like we tried to make it like a colorful animal. Yeah. You know, dinosaurs, they're displaying to each other, they're communicating. We know a lot of dinosaurs have feathers. Yeah, yeah. We've got these filaments on the back of Triceratops. And those are what we call proto feathers. They're single filaments that are kind of the evolutionary ancestors of feathers. That's so cool. Yeah, and we don't have those fossilized most of the time. So we don't strictly know about them for Triceratops. Yeah. But we do have an early relative of Triceratops where it's a remarkable fossil that preserves the skin and these filaments along the back and the tail. So we wanted to include that yeah. knowledge of dinosaurs as close evolutionary relatives of birds that like, you know, share features like that with birds. Amazing. So Beck, speaking of being not precious, have you been in the middle of sculpting or working on something and someone came in and said, hey, we just learned some new things <laughs> and this is all out? <laughs> um, I would know if there's like new things, but I would, I will say like, for instance, on the head, I think I had to re-sculpt or re-carve it a lot, like oh, probably. Wow. Yeah. It took a long time just it, to get it right. Uh, I hope you don't mind a compliment, but the, the the skin looks like it has real weight hanging off a skeleton. Oh, thank you. It's just <laughs> gorgeous. Thank I'm, you. I'm yeah. blown away by this. It's honestly. really amazing. <laughs> Thanks. But I mean, he had so much to do with like, I had no good understanding of like the feet. Right. They're um, weird they're feet. They're so weird, right? They you are would really never... spectacularly weird. So we really worked... Uh, together on kind of figuring out like what they would look like and give it the right spacing and incredible. Yeah. I mean right. we're looking at the side at the moment and you can see like these are two of the fingers. Yeah, these are yeah. the front feet, so they're fingers. Um, <laughs> and they don't have there's nothing on the end of them. They just end like it doesn't oh, right. know what no it's claws. doing. And the claws yeah. are on the three innermost fingers of the hand. And you know, this is like, uh, it's unlike, if you looked at an elephant, that's just not what the foot looks right. like. <laughs> right. um, and we imagine maybe they should look like elephants, but in the real fossils, this is what it like, yeah. what it's yeah. like. And you know, this is happening because, do you know, whenever you see a quadrupedal dinosaur, so a dinosaur with its hands on the grounds, walking as a four-footed land animal, whenever you see that, it had an ancestor that was a biped like us. So that's the first pass is bipedalism. Yeah, so the first dinosaurs are bipeds. Wow. And Triceratops and its relatives, they evolved to be quadrupeds from a bipedal ancestor. This is very different to mammals. Mm. But it seems that a consequence of that is when they, when they evolved to be quadrupeds, you know, you get all kinds of weird hand structures yeah. that are just unlike <laughs> things we see today. Um, before we leave this room, I just wanted to talk about another work in progress. You've got a mosasaur and some uh, a diorama happening up here. What's going on with that? I actually, I'm just seeing the colors on this for the first time. Oh, really? Yeah, so we've been working on this for a little while and we discussed okay. like color references. Um, and this animal you see, that's a mosasaur. And oh. mosasaurs look like kind of like dinosaurs, right? And yeah. they're giant extinct reptiles. But yeah. do you know, they're actually lizards. So lizards are around today and we see them yeah. all over the place. Um, and during the age of dinosaurs, lizards evolved. One of the things one group of lizards do is they evolved to live in the oceans, a bit like whales. Yeah. And they became gigantic. So the biggest lizards that ever lived were mosasaurs that lived at the time of dinosaurs. Terrifying. Um, and I, I never saw, I didn't, I, I'm seeing these colors for the first time today and it's had, like had, really exciting to re me. Um, so I was yeah. gonna ask, how is it? Yeah, it, I'm, I'm really excited. You know, it was the same with Triceratops seeing the colors for the first time. We had in mind, you know, what it looks like, what living animals it's gonna draw on knowledge from. But when the colors go on, it really becomes a real animal. Yeah. And you feel like you're seeing the animal and nobody's seen it before. And like, for me, that's been, I never did this type of thing before I came to the museum, but 
it's like it's an incredible thing. It and sounds it's like beautiful a, as well. It sounds like a magic trick happening all the time here. Yeah, it is. And you know, you can see the other animal here, this yeah, long necked yeah. animal. That's an extinct belongs to an extinct group of reptiles called plesiosaurs that also lived at the time of dinosaurs. Well, one of them's living in Scotland, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so many people's idea of if the Loch Ness Monster existed, what it would look like. Yeah. <laughs> it would look like a plesiosaur. And do you know that there are fossils of freshwater plesiosaurs, small freshwater plesiosaurs in Scotland, uh, but they lived 160 million years ago. So it's we, a little bit too much. Yeah, we think that they're extinct. Um, <laughs> just so much work that goes into this. A couple of weeks ago, I was looking at Jake with how does the how do the scales on the head transition into the general body texture? Yeah, yeah. And like, what's the junction between those going to look like and sort of work as potentially a real animal that doesn't seem incongruous to us? Roger, who who's responsible for the paint job here? Uh, this is done. I mean, the whole thing, not just the paint. Yeah. Um, is the is the work of an incredibly talented colleague, Jake. Okay. He's actually, he's just standing over here. Can we? <laughs> Hello, sir. Hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. All right, I'm going to talk to Jake now, Roger. Right, Thank you. Could. This is a pleasure. I it's really appreciate it. It's amazing. All right, Jake. All right. This was your baby. Yeah, this, this has been a, about a years long effort. Um, and it's been not only a challenge in getting the science right, which yeah. we work with Roger on, but also the engineering of getting these things to fly. Um, oh, they're all off the, a central pillar. Right, although they'll hang in our gallery. Okay. But since we travel these shows, um, some venues don't have that capability to hang things right, from the right, ceiling. Right. So we have this floor stand, which is um, a couple of I-beams that come up through and then yeah. the truss inside the Mosasaur and uh, something similar inside the Plesiosaur. Oh my gosh. So that he floats there. Um, um, talk to me about how a paint job like the Mosasaur here progresses. Uh, do you, were you given any color information about what the dinosaurs might have looked like? Yes, well, we base these creatures on modern relatives. Mm -hmm. And so, um, Rod suggested we go with <laughs> a caiman lizard. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very colorful A really colorful creature. brute. Look at yeah. him. And um, although this animal has more texture. So I see the paint job on this looks mostly finished. Are you about to start tackling the plesiosaurus paint job? Yes, exactly. So this is the base coat. Mm -hmm. It's underpainting layers. Plesiosaur is modeled on this uh, monitor lizard. Okay. And so I'm starting in now with these sort of fleshy tones and then the yellow coming on the back. I'm gonna add in this sort of greenish hues. Oh, that's gonna be so much fun. It's, it's a lot of fun. Do you start with like just a pencil, just sort of sketching in where you're gonna paint? Um, no, I just kind of go for it. Wow. Got these big, you know. Big old HVLP, big air, yeah. Yeah, air, um, airbrushes and then we've got smaller guys <laughs> to get in more with yeah, the detail. Yeah. And you start with the light colors and, and move towards the darker colors at the end. And then there's some push-pull. Yep. It's gorgeous. Thank it is you. really, really Thank beautiful. You. It's been a lot of fun. Dude, oh my gosh. I, I'm, I'm so excited on your behalf. I, like painting is my favorite part of the process. Is, uh -huh. uh, what is your favorite part of the process? I really like the sculpting. Yeah. I like getting in with the textures and um, the carving stage. Which um, So this is after you've made the model larger, built an internal skeleton and covered it with foam. The, the bringing it into its final form and then giving it a skin. Yes, but before the skin, there's the foam carved section. Right. right. And that for me is the most fun because you're, you're making these you're big sweeping it. changes and pulling out muscles and, um, and getting in with some wrinkles yeah. too in the foam stage. And then the fiberglass, you're gonna actually lose a little bit of that detail, which you right. then go back in with your final coatings to get the detail back again and, and the scale textures and those things, which are more labor intensive. But the, the carving stage for me is the most fun because that's when it really pops as, a, as an animal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm curious about the eyes. Is, is, that, is that also your department? Yeah, uh, the, eyes, that, the eyes were a trick with the Mosasaur because he has huge eyes. Yeah. Those are projector lenses that I found oh! in the dumpster here at the museum. <laughs> So we had this, there was like 30 projector lenses being, they were retired or obsolete yeah, or yeah. It's broken or I'm not, I don't know why they were in the dumpster, but I salvaged them and I had to cut them out of the, uh, you know, the lens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, then I just printed out images, which I worked on in Photoshop and 
got them just right and put them behind the lens. Dude, that is so cool. Thank yeah, you so out. much. This is just amazing work. Pleasure. Oh, I wish I could watch you paint the plesiosaur. Thank you so much for watching that video. If while watching any of my videos you like, any of the t-shirts that you see me wearing, well, you can go buy them. And there's two places you can get them. First, you can go to tested-store.com, a web address that my crew laughs is one of the hardest things for me to remember in my whole brain. But now they've given me a second URL. You can now go to adamsavage.com and buy any of the t-shirts you see me wearing on this channel. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff there too. Thanks.